shadow mapping. So if we look at Trap and Emulate, it assumes, or really requires two things. One, that instructions act the same way in CPL0 and CPL3. And two, Two, instructions that reveal the CPL level are privileged. So not only are instructions that require privileges privileged, so for instance, changing the CPL is privileged, but also knowing what the CPL is is privileged because if you're spending, if the kernel is thinking that it is in CPL 0, but it's actually running in CPL 3, and if it ever looks and says, hey, what's my CPL level? We need to be able to tell it, you're zero, even though you're really running in level three. And x86 breaks both of these, unfortunately. So traditional virtualization doesn't work on x86. Let's give some examples of this. So for example, on this one, instructions that reveal CPL level? Well, a simple example, The standard way we read the CPL level is we look at the CS code segment register. And the code segment register has in the bottom two bits the CPL level. Well, there we go. And this is not a privileged instruction trying to access the code segment register. So if you try to access the code segment register, all of a sudden the guest OS can now look and see, wait, I thought I was running in CPL 0, but I'm actually running in CPL 3. Right? thought I was running in kernel mode, I'm actually running in user mode. Something is off. Uh, an example of instructions that act differently. So if we, for instance, uh, do a push flag, right, it'll push the E flags. In CPL0, all of E flags is pushed. So E flags unchanged is pushed. In CPL3, it masks out. So it pushes with the interrupt flag masked out. And actually, the same thing is true uh, for a pop flags as well. Again, if you're in CPL3, it, even if the flags in the stack say that the interrupt is on, we're, we're, we're going to be going ahead and masking that. Um, another example is IRET. If you are in CPL3, let's actually look. If you're in CPL0, we know what's going to happen is it's going to restore from the stack the stack pointer and the stack segment. Because when we did a trap, uh, those were saved because we were changing ring levels, right? changing CPL levels. If we're in CPL3, though, when we return, it will not restore those. And in, as well as not restoring, it's not going to pop them off the stack. right? So that's, uh, that's a real problem. We have two possible approaches to fix this. So we have two possible solutions. Possible solution number one is binary translation. That is, we're going to rewrite offending instructions to behave correctly. At a minimum, what we could do is just do the instructions that don't trap and cause them to trap. Uh, or or the ones that don't work properly, depending on what level you're on, go ahead and rewrite those two. So for instance, we could rewrite every pop FL with calling a trap. We could write, rewrite every push FL with calling a trap. We could rewrite every reference, every read of the code segment register to do the same thing. And then we could do the standard trap and emulate. Although while we're doing binary translation, we could rewrite offending instructions in all sorts of different ways if we want. So we don't have to just rely on trap and emulate. If we're rewriting instructions, we can go ahead and emulate in different, in, in, in different ways, other rewriting. But anyway, that's one approach. And then the other approach is hardware virtualization. But by going ahead and somehow extending the x86 to make it classically virtualizable. And it turns out the way we're going to do that is not, so these are changes that have been made 
by Intel and AMD to the architecture to allow this. We're going to look at what that is. You might think that what it is is just go ahead and change, for instance, push FL and pop FL to trap, uh, accessing the CS register to trap. But the problem is that would ruin all uh, existing code, right, that assumes that stuff won't trap. So there's another approach they're going to be used, and we'll look at that.